God. Praise be to God. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Praise be to God. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Gaines Virtue Sunday Service. Praise God. I am Ellie Elisha Small, and we at Global Apostolic Movement, also known as GAME, under the leadership of Chief Apostle LaShawn Reese and Pastor Beverly Cole. To thank everyone for tuning into this live broadcast. Praise be to God. We are excited that you decided to join us and we prepared to hear from our very own Pastor Beverly Cole with a word from the Lord. So before we get started, we invite you to click and share button. Praise God, share this broadcast and tag others so that they also may experience this service. Praise God, we welcome you to worship and receive the word of God in your comfort of your own homes with us. Praise God, as we prepare our hearts and minds and give all the glory to God. Praise God, we would also like to invite those who like to be a member of this virtual church ministry. If you are interested, please, God, please send, yeah, as, please send us a DM message on Global Apostolic Movement Facebook page for more information, praise God. If you'd like to know more about GAM and our belief or submit a request, please visit our website at gamemovement.org. Praise be to God. We thank God for all of you. Praise God. Now a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day that you have given us, Father. We know that everything we have come from you. You say we're two or three together. There you are in the midst of us. Praise God. And we are more than us together together this afternoon to give glory and praise to your glory, divine name. Oh, Father, we come before you thanking you for everything that you do for us. There are so many blessings that you have blessed upon us that we can't even numb them. Praise God. We thank you, Father, for everything you have given us. When your word go forth today, Lord, let it prick somebody heart and mind. Praise God. Let it touch down to the very core of their being, Lord. Let us be hearers of the doers of the word and not hearers on it. Praise God. Let your word sanctify us and bring us closer to you, that you may be glorified in everything that we do. Father God, we thank you. We had a thousand tongues. We couldn't praise you enough for your goodness, for your mercy. Praise God. You say we're two or three together. You are also in the midst, Lord. So we feel your presence in the midst of our service. Let the word that comes out of our pastor's mouth, mouth not fall to the ground, but let it accomplish your purpose, Lord. Let it touch our hearts and our mind. Praise God. Let us be doers of the word and not hear alone. To sanctify us, O oh Lord, through thy truth. For Thy word is truth. Praise God. Now the service is turned over to our very own Pastor Beverly Cole. Praise be to God. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank, thank Hallelujah. You, Jesus. We give you all praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. Amen. Amen. Welcome again. Welcome again. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I'm excited about the new changes that we've made to our time. I'm excited that, as Elder said, that this is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. I don't know what's going on in your life, and I know I say that all the time, but I don't. But one thing I do know that praises and prayer changes things. The one thing I do know is when we learn how to be content in every situation, then we have the ability to rise above. We won't let the the enemy overtake us. We won't let him steal our joy. We won't let him steal our peace because we know that no matter what, God is in control. We know that no matter what, he will pull us out of every situation because his word decrees it. It declares it. And he said that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but he shall deliver us from them all. So I don't know about you, but can I tell you, you have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So no matter what comes your way, you can always rejoice. You can always give praise because he said that he always causes us to triumph. That within itself is enough reason for you to praise, for you to begin to honor, for you to begin to clap your hands, for you to begin to shout, because it's in the shout that shackles are loosed. It's in the shout that chains are broken. It's in the shout that the Jericho's walls come tumbling down. It's in the shout when the enemy is stifled and he becomes paralyzed. It's in your shout. And within your shout, that means you have to open up your mouth with a genuine heart of Praise with a genuine heart of thanksgiving, even in the midst. See, sometimes to praise him, to worship or even give thanks is what it's called a sacrifice. It's going to cause you something. It's going to cost you, amen, 
absolutely really nothing, but you getting up out of yourself, you coming out of that bag, it's going to cost you the ability to change your mind. So there are some things that you have to do. There are times when, as David said, you have to begin to speak to yourself because he began to speak to himself and he says, why are you cast down? Oh, my soul. In other words, why are you disappointed? Why are you discouraged? Why do you act like you don't have a king? Why do you act like God is not in control? Why are you cast down? When you know whose you are and you know whose you are, then you're able to stand in the midst of your enemies and begin to rule. You're able to stand in the midst of your enemies and worship because did he not tell you that he will prepare a table before you in the midst of your enemies? How about this? When because the Lord is our shepherd and he said he's going to prepare a table for us. Can you imagine eating real good? Can you imagine that everything that you put off of the table is a blessing and it's satisfying? Can you imagine doing all of these things and just imagine everything that you love is sitting at the table? Everything that you could possibly want is at the table. But did he not say, I will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies? Let me give you this to think about. While you're yet eating, he's going your enemies are watching while you're yet getting your peace. Your enemies are watching while you're yet passing the praise, passing the joy. Your enemies are still watching because God is still in control. Can I invite somebody to the table of peace? Can I invite somebody to eat at the table of blessings, the abundant blessings, not what you just pick and choose. Jesus died for it all the abundance of it. So how dare you just pick and choose a little here and a little there. I don't know about you people of God, but I want everything that God has promised me. I want my inheritance. And guess what? If you don't want yours, I want yours because I want to get what my grandfather, my grandmother, my great and my all my ancestors, they didn't get as long as it's the goodness of God. As long as it's the table that he's prepared so that he can show my enemies that they didn't win. So I don't know about you, but like I say, this is the day that you need to rejoice. This is the day that you need to change your mindset because no matter what, God is going to always cause you to triumph. Again, I just want to welcome you. Elder, you did such an awesome job with the welcome and the prayer. I just want to extend another welcome to you and just say you're not only welcome to just be a part, you're welcome to join us, amen, of this Bible believing, amen, word eating glory carriers, this community of believers that love the Lord. And we just want to again thank uh, our chief apostle, LaShawn Reese, who is the founder of Global Apostolic Movement. We moving, y'all. We moving. Because if the world can do the things with social media, why can't I? Why can't we? The word says that the world is more shrewder than the children of God, than the children of light. We need to change that. We're not copying the world. We're just using what they have. Amen. And not only just using, we're going to take over. Can I say that again? We're here to take over because we were set in authority. Those that are called to be governing agents of God in this earth realm. It's time for us to quit sitting back, people of God, and begin to take over. No more compromising. No more um, softness. No more. It's over. It's time for us to take over. And again, welcome. And I am Pastor Beverly Cole, and I want to get into this word. God just really blessed me. And it all started out from reading a passage of scripture in uh, Esther. As a matter of fact, it started with Esther 3. And I'm just going to read a little bit to you. And then I'm going to release the title as to what God gave me and how it came about. And it goes on to read. And this is Esther 3. And it's starting. I'm going to start with verse 1. And it says, King Zerus honored Haman. That was one of the his how, how when I say one of his nobles in his kingdom or an official, but King it says King Zerus honored Haman, the Agite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. Have you ever uh, witnessed people that have been elevated to a new position? And when they've been elevated to a, a new position, as my old pastor would say, they become all such and much right? They think that they are greater. But even with this elevation, it says all the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, to this man. They knelt down and paid homage and honor to Haman. For the king had commanded this concerning him. So in other words, the king set him in place, but he also gave them the decree or spoke to them and says, anytime you see him, I want you to kneel down 
and I want you to honor him. Can I say this? And I don't want to be offensive, but I, I, I didn't come to play either. <laughs> How many of us as leaders in the body of Christ have been elevated to a certain position in the body? Because we do know that God, when Jesus ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. It says some apostles, some prophets, some teachers, some evangelists, and some pastors. Oh, I got them all in there. It's five of them. And so when he gave them that, we were not called to be elevated. When those have been put in authority, maybe even as your boss, they've been given a, a new position. But for some reason, we get the big head or we become proud. We become boastful. We think that we're higher than anyone else, but that is not what we were called to do. And so this is the attitude that Haman had when the king had elevated him. And everybody that saw him had to bow down and give him honor. Can I tell you what it means when you bow down to someone? And I'm going to keep moving on, but I want you to understand. It says to bow down. It says... You bend your body very low, especially as a way to show respect. That's okay. When you show respect, but then there's a flip side to that. And it goes on to say another definition is because when we bow down in respect, we think about the kings, we think about the uh, queens that they honor, but that's different, you know, to a sense. You're just honoring the office. You're respecting the office. But in Haman's case, he was taking it one step further and it's, Number two, it says to show weakness by agreeing to the demands of following the orders of someone or something. So in this case, they wanted the men and the women to bow down in order as a, as a form of an order that was given because they needed them to show respect to Haman. And then it goes on to say to show respect to someone or something that they are more powerful than you. So let me read it on because I just wanted you to get that definition. It says to show weakness by agreeing to the demands of following the orders of someone or something else. And so it goes on to say in verse three, I'm just laying this out before you. I'm gonna go back to verse two. Help me, Holy Ghost. Let me call myself because this was good to me and I saw it a whole nother way, amen? And it says all the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman for the king had commanded this concerning him but Mordecai see there is always that one but Mordecai would not kneel or pay honor then the royals at the king's gate asked Mordecai why do you disobey the king's command and they kept asking them this and verse 4 says day after day they spoke to him <laughs> but he refused mm, to comply. Therefore, they told Haman, the one he should have been bowing down to. Now, Haman was an Agite. In other words, he was also from the lineage of the Amalekites, and they had a deep disdain or hatred for Jews. And so here you have Mordecai, who is a Jew. He wanted him to bow down to his enemy. He wanted him to bow down and honor him. He wanted to give up what he knows as respect and loyalty, because it goes on, let me read. And it says, therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai behavior would be tolerated for he had told them that he was a Jew. In other words, when they went back to tell Haman that Mordecai would not bow, he said, I'm not going to bow because first of all, I'm not going to worship you because the only God I worship is the Lord God most high. Because see, I am a Jew and I am of a different lineage. I don't worship anything or anyone other than my God. So I will not bow. I understand because see, you have to look at it from their perspective. They considered an act of treason and disobedience because Mordecai wouldn't bow. But can you imagine this man? How many of us have stood and we were told or asked to compromise our beliefs? How many of us have been challenged to the point of death if we don't change our minds, if we don't bow down? So again, I just want to lay it out because this is what started out to be where the Lord gave me the topic. And it's the topic for tonight is to whom will you bow? 
to whom will you bow? Because see, they wanted Mordecai. In other words, this Christian man in modern, modern day time, because we know that Jews are still out there. I'm talking about the believers that have given their lives over to Christ because we understand that the Lord said that we're not to worship any other God or to bow down to any other God, to make any other images in, it, in their likeness and to worship them. And then it goes on. And so I ask you tonight, to whom will you bow? What has pressed you? Who is pressing you to give up your allegiance from God to join them? And 1 Kings 18 and 21, we all know the story about them being on Mount Carmel when Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal. This was his question that he asked all of those that were in the assembly. The same question I'm going to ask you. And it says, then Elijah approached the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? How long will you waver between two opinions? But if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people did not answer him. Is anybody out there willing to answer? How long are you going to go back and forth if God is real, if he's not? How long are you going to go back and forth with useless ideologies that's causing you to doubt who God really is? How long are you going to allow the enemy to play with your mind? It says, now, if God be God, or if the Lord is Lord, then you worship him. You're going to have to draw a line in the sand. There is no more lukewarmness. Can I tell you, there's not even a fence. There was a time when I used, you know, people would say, I straddled the fence. The Lord told me, no, you're going to hell because there's no such thing as straddling the fence. You're either going to be hot or you're going to be whole. There is a uh, cold. There is no middle ground. Remember in the book of Revelations, it talked about he spewed them out. You either going to be hot or you're going to be cold. So how long are you going to go back and forth uh, with these two opinions? How long are you going to doubt that the Lord is good? Because if he's good to you today, uh, he's going to be good tomorrow. If he's good to you today and tomorrow, he was good to you back in the past. Because the things that were, came upon you didn't kill you. Because we understand, according to John 10, 10, that the thief comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. He may have uh, dashed your dreams. He may cause friction in your marriage. He may have even brought about divorce, but it didn't kill you. It didn't kill your lineage. It didn't kill your generation. It didn't kill your bloodline. See, his desire is not only to steal, kill, but to destroy. He didn't win. Even then, God was still good. When they crept into your room, God was still good because there was a time God wouldn't allow you to remember until now. Now you're able to face it. Now you realize it wasn't your fault. Now you're no longer defiled because of the blood. Now you understand that what the enemy meant for evil, God is turning it for your good because you stand. Now somebody else can stand. Now you can reach back and pull everyone that has been dealing with incest, maybe even rape. You can pull them out of darkness and let them know that God is still good. He is still merciful and his truth still endures. In other words, when he said it then, he means it now that he has covered you. He has washed you and the smell will no longer be on you of the abuse, the smell of the stench or even the memories are going to have to be dissipated. In other words, they need to disappear. I decree and declare right now that they're being disintegrated. The Mm, the tape that plays over and over in your mind. I, I sever them by the word of God and I loose them from its assignment to cause you to doubt who you are. So I'm going to ask you again, if the Lord is Lord and Baal is Baal, whom will you bow? Today is your day to make that decision. The choice is your, yours because in Matthew 6, 24 and 26, it reads, no one can serve two masters. For either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is money, possessions, fame, status, or whatever is of value to you more than God. You can't serve to. Because by serving two, you're going to have somebody that's being neglected. And because you shouldn't worship no other God or have no other God before you, to whom will you bow? 
That's my question to you today. Who has your ear? Who are you serving more than God? What are you thinking about that is causing you to stay up late at night? That's causing you to meditate on it? Because when you think about it all the time, it's a form of meditation. The Lord says that we are to read his word day and night, and we're supposed to meditate on his word in order to make our way prosperous and have good success. So in other words, people of God, who have you bowed your knees to? Who have you put in the place of God? Who are you serving? And who are you worshiping? Uh, who is more devoted and valued higher and respected more to you than God? Who have you bowed to? To whom today will you bow? And I want to move on over and I want to just bring up a few of the ones that did not bow because sometimes we think we're the only ones. Sometimes we think we don't go through anything. Sometimes we think that the plate is too heavy and it's, it's, it's not doable that we have to bow, we have to succumb. Because see, somebody might be saying, see, pastor, you don't understand that I need to have my bills paid. And there was a way I used to get my bills paid, but now I'm waiting. I've given my life to you. I've quoted the scriptures. I stood on the word. I did not turn back to my old ways of getting the money, but it seems like God ain't moving fast enough. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying to me, that his name is Jehovah Jireh. He's the one who makes provision. Or maybe you're the one that's dealing with a sickness or an illness, and you've been praying to the Lord. You fasted, you prayed, You've anointed yourself with oil. You went to the elders. They anointed you in the prayer of faith. But for some reason, it doesn't look like God is moving. For some reason, it doesn't look like your body is being healed. But some reason, the enemy is even talking while I'm talking, trying to get you to doubt and to bow down and begin to worship him by saying God ain't able. And if he was, he would have healed you by now. Maybe you don't have enough faith to believe. But did you ever stop to think? Mm that this is maybe your opportunity to learn God and to know of him in a different way? Did you ever think that in the midst of all of your prayers and all of your waiting, that God is putting it on you to make preparations? Because see, you used to have a cane. You used to make a preparations or a room for the wheelchair. But when God begins to heal, you're not going to need the cane. Have you ever tried to change your garments? Have you made room? Do you even have a bank account? Have you set up even a savings? Do you have a, a 401k, do you have, I know these are earthly things, but remember the word of God says that the, uh, that the riches are stored up, that the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. In other words, when the shift comes in, it's going to come. When the healing takes place, then it's going to take place. Have you even adjusted your mind to thinking, I'm not going to be like this anymore? Or do you fall back and that to that place where you are and begin to utter out of your mouth that you're still broke, you're still busted, you're still disgusted. I can't pay this. I can't pay that. I'm going to always be like this. And for some of you that made arthritis your friend, by calling them author. See, some of you have even given the dis-ease a name and you sit next to it like it's a pillow or it's your, your uh, safety blanket, but yet you want to be healed. But you named the circumstance you're trying to come out of. So in this season, can I ask you again, to whom will you bow? Because when you think like that, you've already bowed to Baal. And Baal came here. Baal came safe. Baal, in other words, the false gods. There are people that you've elevated, that you've given all manner of resources too. But when you were down and out and you went to them, see, God didn't call them to feed you. He didn't call them to save you. He didn't call them to redeem you. He called them to preach the good news of the gospel, to teach you. He told us to go ye therefore and make disciples of men, teaching them and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So if you elevated them, they got to come down. If you put them in the place of God, they got to come down because he said he will have no other God before him. We want to look at Daniel. We all talk about the story and the Lord just blessed me with this. Can I ask you again, to whom will you bow? To whom will you bow? Daniel 3 and verse 6, and it says, whoever... The, this is the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We always talk about that by being in the fiery furnace, that there was a fourth man in the fire. We always go on and on about that. But do you know why they were in the fire? Do you know why the fourth man showed up? Do you know why? But I'm getting ready to tell you. Daniel 3 and 6, and it reads, whoever does not fall down and worship, will immediately be thrown 
into the blazing fiery furnace. In other words, they were telling Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they were all <laughs> exiles. But they found themselves in this kingdom under Nebuchadnezzar. And so Nebuchadnezzar had built this golden image. And it was that no other, they were to bow down and worship this image. Because if you don't bow down and worship the image, you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And so can you imagine they have this choice? They could either bow to Baal or bow to the image or bow to God. To whom will you serve? When you have this choice, and they say, because if you don't, this is what's going to happen. And so here we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace, and they're seeing the fourth man in the fire. But we don't talk about how they got there is what I said. We don't look and see, but we're so concerned about the fourth man. But are you in the fire because you did not bow? Are you in the fire because you honor righteousness? Are you in the fire? I'm talking about the furnace of affliction. There's the difference because that's something being burned off of you as well. But I'm talking about, are you in the fire? Not because of something you created or something that life happened to you or the enemy. Because see, they were in the furnace burning because they chose not to bow down to Baal. Have you refused your enemies lately? See, they were faced with the choice. What are you facing? Are you facing the, how do I say, the decision to serve God, even though it doesn't look like he's coming through? Uh, who are you serving? Are you going to jump ship and you're just going to run after the enemy? Can I ask you again, to whom will you bow? Because they refuse to bow down and worship another God. And because they refuse to bow down and worship the golden image, they found themselves in that fiery furnace. They said it was seven times hotter, 10 times hotter. In other words, there was no way they should have made it out. There was no way that they should have been able to stand in the midst of it. And it says that they were bound and that they were gagged and they were tied and they threw them in. They threw them into the furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar, he all he, he was beside himself. And on the backside, see, you, although he was an enemy, he knew who God's children were. See, although the enemy is coming against you, there are people around you that know who you are. They knew that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wasn't going to bow down. They already knew it. But they had to trap them up. Do you know? Trip them up and trap them. <laughs> Because, see, it wasn't because they weren't obedient. See, they just couldn't put their hands on them. They had to have a reason. So they created and orchestrated a reason to pull the men of God down and have them to bow. Do you know the enemy will do the same thing to you? He will orchestrate a reason. Maybe it's on your job. Maybe it's with your finances. Maybe it's with your career. Maybe it's with your children. Maybe it's with your marriage. He will orchestrate something in your life to see if you will bow. Will you bow and not pray to God? Will you bow? And bowing is not totally just a stance. It's your opinion. How long will you go back and forth with two opinions? Either God is God. You're going to either worship him all the time you're going to praise him all the time, even through the good and the bad. You don't have to praise him all the time with just a happy countenance. I have praised and worshiped and offered thanksgiving with tears running down my face because I refused. I had to make a conscious decision. I will not bow. I will not turn my, my back on the Lord. He's been too good to me. And there are things when you have to go back and you have to remember when the last time you were broke. Because see, I believe some of us, this is not your first rodeo with this. And this is not your first rodeo with sickness. But the same God, Right now, it's the same God back then. He never changes. And so when you're going through your tribulations, your trials, your testings, and even being tempted, will you bow? We know another one, Daniel. I mentioned him earlier, Daniel 6, 10, and through 16. We always say about Daniel being in the lion's den and how the angels, God sent the angels to shut their mouths. Do you know why Daniel was in the lion's den? They again, once again, tried to trap the man of God because he was he was wise. He was considered one of the wisest in the 
some of the, they were the smartest men that came in from exile. And so they knew that they worshiped their God. And so they had issued a decree because they were trying to get Daniel out of position. I'm talking about the satraps. I'm talking about the governors. I'm talking about the officials in that day in the kingdom. They had a hard time watching this exile, if you may. In other words, you don't need to be up in here. They were captives. Can you imagine being a captive or brought in to be a slave and now you're sitting in a place of authority? I'm sure that didn't go over well with them. And not only that, you don't even worship our God. So this is what we're going to do because we tried everything else. You, you don't fall back. You're a man of integrity. You do everything you say you're going to do. You're not a murderer. You're not a slanderer. You don't backbite. You don't murder. You don't do any of the fleshly things. So the only way that we can trip you up in order to take you out is to have our king write out a decree and seal it, saying that whoever bows their knee and pray to a God other than their God will be thrown into the lion's den. And then the verse goes on to say, can you imagine that is sitting before you? I can't imagine that somebody would put that before me. In other words, I have to make a decision whether I'm going to stand or whether I'm going to bow. But they knew. And this is what Daniel did. This is starting with verse 10. I'm not going to read it all because we know the end of the story. It says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, in other words, Daniel knew that the decree was made. He knew that it was signed. He went into his house. Notice he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber, in his house, in his chamber toward Jerusalem, the holy city. It says he kneeled upon his knees three times a day. It might be saying he knelt upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. In other words, he didn't change his routine. Yes, the decree was made, but whose report are you gonna believe? Whose decree are you gonna believe? See, God is all powerful. Their God has no power. God is all powerful. He's all knowing and he had a purpose for Daniel. But because the enemy tried to trip him up, it says, now let me show you how bad my God is. Let me show you what I'm working with. Let me show you who I pray to. I'm not gonna bow to your God. I refuse to stop praying to the Lord God Almighty. Although because of our indiscretions, because of our sins, we find ourselves in captivity, but that doesn't mean that God ain't able. So in other words, I'm gonna show you how bad my God is. I'm gonna continue to pray. See, mm, I'm going to ask you before I say that, to whom will you bow your knee? You haven't been faced with being thrown in the lion's den. You have not been challenged with going into the fiery furnace. And it says, then these men assembled and found Daniel praying. See, somebody's always watching you. I'm gonna, are you going to change up your belief because somebody's watching? Are you going to change and stop praying and eating the word because somebody said, well, it don't take all of this. who To whom are you going to bow? Are you going to continue to serve the Lord? The one who brought you out time and time again, that the same God that's given you more than one chance. And then they said, then they came near and spoke before the king. And the king had already signed the, the decree. And then when they brought them up and it says, oh, king, shall... Um, let me go back. I'm reading from the King James. And it says, the king answered and said, the thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians. In other words, because the king had a, a, a love, a kind of love for Daniel, he did not want to see him go into the fiery, I'm sorry, into the lion's den. And so he was trying to get them to change their mind. Although the enemy is there, do you know that there are some enemies uh, that are there with you that you kind of like? Overlook. See, sometimes your greatest enemies are the ones that are walking with you. Even in the military, they call it friendly fire. Back in my day, we used to call them backstabbers. See, you do have some people you do understand that you do fellowship with. 
You do have co-workers and friends and family members that ain't always in your corner. And they're just waiting for the opportunity to bring up accusations against you. Because once you repent it, we do understand and you do understand that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. You do understand that he's a liar and a murderer. You do understand that he's waiting for the opportunity the opportunity to take you down, to cause you to bow your knee to him instead of God. He's causing you and wants you to break your allegiance, to turn from the God most high, from El Shaddai, from Elohim, from El Roi, the God who sees he wants you to turn and begin to bow down and worship him. You do understand that's why he was kicked out of heaven because he wanted this throne to be higher than God. And it goes on to say, then the king commanded them and they brought Daniel and they cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, I believe he had to say it, thy God. Can you imagine when the one that put the signet ring on the decree, the one that authorized you to be thrown into the lion's den, I can only imagine he probably leaned over to Daniel and he whispered in his ear, your God whom, I'm going to read it from the King James Version. It says, thy God, whom, thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. In other words, your God, <laughs> who you pray to all the time, you worship him, you honor him, you serve him, your God will deliver you. Isn't it awesome or why is it? That the world, I've said this before, know and understand the name of Jesus. Why is it that the world know and understand that there is really no other God? They tried to cause us to renounce by bringing up meaningless accusations, by bringing up things that will cause division in the church. And whenever we're ready to stand up, they always cry out that you're prejudiced. No, I don't hate the person, I just hate the sin because I'm learning to love what he loves and hate what he hates. I'm not gonna be rude because my God is not rude, he's loving. But at the same time, he's still my God. I've been created in his image. So the very things that he strive, that he is, I'm striving for him. He said, be holy for I am holy. See, I'm striving for, for all of that. I have not yet arrived because I bless God that he is see the author and the finisher of my faith. He's still working things out in me and working things in me, amen? But yet, Daniel did not bow. And we know the story that the next morning when they woke up, see, the king really couldn't get no rest because although he wasn't verbally saying any things, I believe he may be moaning and groaning on his bed because he was restless. And in the interim of him moaning and groaning, you do understand that it talks about this, the groaning and the moanings that we can't, that we utter, that only the Lord God can interpret. The moanings and the groanings. I, I, I don't understand them all, but he does. So he was on, the, on his bed crying out that the Lord deliver Daniel. There are enemies that you have. They don't want to see your total demise. Or maybe they just don't want the blood shed on their hands. But there are some people that are close to you, may never acknowledge the anointing on you or what God does through you, or maybe what he's already taken you out of. Maybe he's even transformed you and they can't see. But that's okay. You weren't here for them. We were created with a purpose. That's to rule in this earth realm, to create heavenly colonies here on earth. In other words, what I mean is kingdom colonies here on earth, heavenly, to bring that which is in heaven down to earth, to rule and to reign. But we got comfortable. We got comfortable. We became like the ones we should have been taking over. We became like the very ones that bowed down, that did not worship the Lord God Almighty because it was convenient. Mm. It was easy. It didn't cost you nothing. See, the kingdom, salvation is free. But yes, the kingdom will cost you everything. It's going to cost you who you serve. It's going to cost you time with the Lord. It's going to cost you because in order to rule and to reign, you're going to have to have relationship. It's going to cost you quiet time. It's going to cost you turning your back on the things that are familiar. That's not always easy, but it's doable. And the last example I'm going to give 
I want you to turn with me. For those who don't, I pray you have the scriptures. You can go back and read them because, see, I want you to know where I'm coming from. I don't want you thinking that we at Global Apostolic Movement just spout out words. We teach the unadulterated truth, the word of God. And it's coming from you from the very scriptures. And I pray you're able to understand that you need to know, and this is the season and the time where a line has been drawn in the sand. You're either going to be for God or you're against him. Because the word says that you can't serve two masters. You either going to change and you're going to serve God. He said, if the Lord is Lord, you serve him. But if Baal is Baal, you serve him. In other words, if the devil is who you want to serve, then you serve him. But make up your mind one way or the other because you can't have it both ways. Because when you try to operate and you say you're straddling the fence, no, you hell bound. Because see, you're either going to be all in or you're going to be all out. So, to whom will you bow your knee? To whom will you bow down? To whom will you compromise your principles? To whom will you give up everything to serve just for temporary pleasure? Just for a quick need to be met? Are you willing to throw it all away? Just for one? You're going after one when God has plenty. The word abundant, the word exceedingly and abundantly. That's more than you can even imagine a thing. You're going after one. God said, I got a whole table. I have an array of blessings just waiting to be showered down on you. So who will you bow to today? Matthew 4, and I'm going to start at uh, verse 8. I'm sorry, Matthew 4, 1 through 11. And it goes on to talk about verse 8, and it says, the Spirit of God Jesus was led into the desert by the spirit of God to be tempted by the devil. And he was tested after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He was physically weak. He was hungry. He was exhausted because when you give up that kind of fast, I'm talking about a fast. See, we cheat. I praise God for the cheat sheets because when Jesus was in the wilderness, he had no water and he had no food. He stayed there for 40 days and 40 nights. He doesn't do like we do. How, how do we do it? Okay, we're going to fast from six to three. We, we not going to eat meat. We're going to fast. I'm talking about a hardcore fast. And when he came out of the fasting, he was only met with the devil trying to get him to bow. And it goes on to say, and you know, let me stop and put a pin here because some people may be saying, well, you you know, Pastor, Jesus, although he was in the flesh, he was still divine. He had to deal with his challenges because if you go to Hebrews 4 and 18, it says, we do not have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. What is it saying here? It's saying that, yes, Jesus was flesh. Yes, he was still divine. But he had to go through so many different things to be tempted by the devil because he had to be able to relate to us from the flesh. Can I say that again? But yet without sin. So if Jesus endured, and I know it's going to take a lot for us, we are learning to be imitators. So we have to learn how to endure these hardships, learn how to endure without sinning. You sin with your mouth. You sin with our actions. We sin when we bow. We sin instead of being like Jesus and begin to quote the scriptures. And then you might, somebody might be saying, well, you know, I heard it said that God doesn't tempt that if the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness or into the desert to be tempted, but isn't that going against? God tests the devil tempts, but God is not opposed to giving you or allowing the enemy to touch you for a little bit, to get out of you what needs to be out and to test your loyalty to him. We all know about Job. He asked the devil, had you tried my servant Job? We all know about Peter. Satan desires to tempt to test, uh, sorry, to sift you as wheat. So it's not uncommon that the Lord will use the very one to begin to sift you, to begin to tempt you, to begin to test you, to see where your allegiance is. 
And it goes on to say here, and I'm going to get into the meat because I'm talking about Jesus now. Now we know. We know that Jesus was tempted by Satan three times, but I want to come in on the third time, okay? <laughs> and this it says that, again, Jesus was led into the desert to be tempted by Satan. This is the third attempt, verse eight, again. Notice I said again. So don't think it's going to be just a one-time thing. See, some of us get all crazy since we came out of that. We think there's not going to be any more. No. But do you know for every test you come out of, your, your, your sword ought to be sharpened a little bit more. You ought to have more endurance. You ought to be more courageous because what didn't kill you should have made you stronger. Now your vision is a little bit more open. Now you're more sensitive in the spirit. Now you know your discerner is acting even like, hey, why well, I remember this old show used to be called Lost in Space. And whenever the robot would sense danger, he would cry out, danger, danger, Will Robinson. And his hands would flail all over the place. This is not a place to where you ought to be fearful, but your discerner is turned up so that when the enemy comes in or anything's coming to trip you up, trap you, or to bring you down or to cause you to bow to another, an alarm ought to go out in your inner man to telling you, uh-uh, look again, uh-uh, test that spirit. Uh-uh, turn away. That is not from the Holy Ghost because see, the devil knows how to bless too. So in this season, your discerner needs to be turned up. Who hallelujah, past maximum if possible. And it says that again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. Verse nine, all this I will give you. He said, now it amazing. He's trying to tempt the creator. Okay, I'm gonna leave that right there. And it says, all this I will give to you if you will bow down and worship me. Satan, understand, we call him the prince of the power of the air, but he has limited authority. As a matter of fact, the authority that he had was what was given over by Adam and Eve in the garden. At the fall of man, God gave Adam and Eve dominion over his creation. And when he seduced them and they committed high treason in the Garden of Eden, they gave over their power and their authority over to the enemy. And I'm going to move fast because I want you to get it all. And it goes down and it begins to where Jesus comes in and he begins to tell them his response to the devil. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So I'm going to ask you, when the enemy came to you, all dressed up, when the enemy came to you, you were looking for a job. And that one was kind of easy. The door was open, so you walked in and you took it. But at what cost? I know now we all are hearing about all of these uh, entertainers that has sold themselves out to the devil. Can I say this? And I need for you to hear. They literally sold their lives, their sons, some even dedicated, their sons, their daughters, maybe their fathers or mothers. I don't know, but they made an allegiance with the devil for fame. Maybe for a movie career, for a movie career, a contract, music industry. But at what cost? Who will you bow? To whom will you bow? Will you trust God all the way? And knowing that the way maker can create something, he is the creator of heaven and earth. There is nothing too hard and impossible for him. Only believe, only stand. I'm asking you, don't bow. Don't bow to the threats of the enemy. Don't bow to the promises of the enemy. God has given you far greater promises as a matter of fact, he's given you a book of in, an inheritance, his last will and testament. You got an old and you got a new. 66 books, all written down of the promises that you have in Christ Jesus. Why would you sell it? Why would you hand it over? For a momentary pleasure. Remember the things which you see are temporary. But the word, but the promises of God are yea and amen. To whom will you bow? Can you stand even while you're crying? Can you stand and believe in your heart? It's the heart posture. 
You can lay down all day long. You can shout. You can run. You can scream. It's the heart posture. To whom will you bow? This season, people of God, you got to make a decision. You've got to make a choice. Because what's coming over the horizon, if you don't know God, if you don't know him in the power of his might, if you don't know him as the creator, if you don't know him as a man of war, if you don't know him as a savior and a deliverer, you're going to be lost. If you don't know him as a shepherd, the one who leads and guides you, if you don't know him mm, as a redeemer, if you don't know him as a provider, you're going to be lost. Not only will he provide, he will comfort. He said he's going to lead you beside the still waters. He's going to silence all of the confusion that's going on around. Because now it's time for us to walk into our prophetic Goshen. And that's the land that is designed. It, there is so much richness. Everything you need is in the land of Goshen. It's almost like the Garden of Eden. Everything you need is there. So I'm going to ask you again, to whom will you bow? But I'm here to tell you, as Joshua said, as for me in my house, <laughs> we're going to serve the Lord. No matter what, I'm still going to serve. I've been through some things, but I didn't give up. I didn't break and I didn't bow. I cried some tears, may have even yelled a little bit, but to whom will you bow? And for those who don't know Jesus in the pardon of your sins, this is your opportunity to get on the winning side. And that's the Lord's side. If you would just repeat after me. Father, I acknowledge that Jesus is the son of God. He died. Third day rose again. Now sits at your right hand. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. And I confess Jesus as Lord. Enter into my heart and take control. Just that simple. Confession. <laughs> profession. Amen. And acknowledging and asking him into your heart. Somebody he's knocking, just open the door. Again, to whom will you bow? I pray this word was a blessing to you. I now turn it over for announcements. If you would like to sow into this movement and financially support the initiatives that we are doing at Global Apostolic Movement, we have five ways for you to do so. You can visit our website at www.gamovement.org to give by credit or debit card. We are on Cash App at dollar sign GA Movement. We are on PayPal and Zelle at our email address, gamovement21 at gmail.com, and also the Givelify app under Global Apostolic Movement. We also invite you to become a covenant partner of Global Apostolic Movement. We are a global movement for the 21st century saints. And for more information on how to become a covenant partner, please visit our website at www.gamovement.org. Click connect, then click covenant partners. Global Apostolic Movement has launched our outreach ministry, and we invite you to join us as we seek to connect globally with those in need. If you are interested in supporting, please be on the lookout for information that will be posted on our social media pages. We thank you in advance for your assistance in helping us with our passion to help others. Become LLC presents ICU Summit hosted by our very own Pastor Beverly Cole, whom is also a speaker as well as guest speakers, Apostle Jacqueline Jones and Apostle Natasha Burks. This summit will focus on trauma, revive, resuscitate, and recovery. The summit will be hosted at the Holiday Inn Express and Suites in Southfield, Michigan on June 21st through the 22nd. Registration is $100, and for more information, please see the flyer that will be posted to Pastor Beverly Cole's social media pages. You're invited to join us for Global Apostolic Movement's first annual Spring Renewal Empowerment Conference, Remnant Arise, Unleashed Power Within. Three powerful days of recovery, restoration, and renewal starting on May 31st through June 2nd. 
Join us for workshops, worship experience, word explosion, and more. Our very own Chief Apostle LaShawn Reese will be our conference speaker. The conference will be held at the Hampton Inn in Deerfield Beach, Florida. Registration is $75. For registration, hotel reservation details, and additional conference information, please visit our website at gamovement.org slash spring dash conference. Reserve your spot early. You don't want to miss this. You can meet us back here next Sunday and every Sunday at 3 p.m. for our virtual church services. However you are tuning in now is the way that you can join next week. We are on the same Zoom meeting ID every week and Facebook Live at Global Apostolic Movement. And now for our benediction. Praise the Lord. We want to take this opportunity, praise God, to thank to thank God for those who gave to this ministry, praise God. You'll see we'll contribute to the growth of God's kingdom, praise God. And we thank God for you. And for those who weren't able to give, we thank God for you having that to give. And for those who had not a chance to give, praise God, at the end of this service, we will display the flyer on the screen, which we, are give, which we have given information, praise God, in case that you won't also contribute to this ministry, praise God. We thank God for all of you. Praise God, God bless and be upon you. Praise God, our prayer is Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless those that gave to this ministry and bless those that had a mind and a heart to give to this ministry. Lord, we ask you to bless those also who didn't have a chance to give to this ministry, but is going to give to this ministry. Father, we thank you. We know that everything we have come from you. So what we give is what you have given to us, and we are giving that back for, to you for the growth of your kingdom. So we ask you to bless the seed, Lord, that's flowing through and out your kingdom. We ask you to add it back to them for forth. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise be to God. My God, what an awesome word for my pastor today. To whom will you serve? Praise God. The Bible says, whoever you keep your mind on, whoever takes up most of your time, that's who you are serving. Praise God. But Jesus said, if you keep your mind and your thought focus on me, praise God, then you'll be serving me. Praise God. Thank God for that word. Praise God. Because whoever you, who, whatever you're giving most of your attention, to that's your God. Praise God. When you black God out of your mind, when you can't think about God at all, when you're concerned with your job, when you're concerned with your finances, when you're concerned about what's going on in your life, that becomes your God because the enemy done pull your mind away from God, our Savior, to worry about the things that you are going through. Praise God. But the earth, remember, praise God, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and everything we have come from God. So we keep our mind on God. That's who we're serving, praise God. We're serving God, and we keep our mind on heavenly things and not on things going around us, praise God. And we keep our focus on Jesus Christ, and we know, praise God, that we're going to be led into God's kingdom, and whatever the enemy try to put in our hearts and our mind won't affect us because our mind is stood fast on the Lord. And we can glorify him in everything that we do, praise God. The scripture says, give thanks in all circumstances, praise God. This is the will of God in Christ towards us. Praise God in Jesus' name. Praise God. Now, benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise God. You are blessed. God bless you all. You are now dismissed from this series. Praise be to God. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, sir.